Chapter Six of The Palace in the Garden by Mrs. Molesworth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read by Ilianthe. Open Sesame. I know thee not, but well my heart interprets, darling, what thou art. Light of some old ancestral hall, queen gem of some proud coronal. For certes, such a perfect grace such lustrous loveliness of face such artless majesty of thine proclaims thee of no sordid line the unknown portrait sir noel peyton there was time the next morning before mr markham came for coaxing a little oil out of mrs munt and fetching a feather from the poultry yard but for no more for mrs munt kind as she was very naturally objected to giving us the oil in one of the best teacups which Gerald had brought for the purpose, thinking it must be an old one, which it was indeed, though not in his sense of the word. So Tib ran off to the princess's tower for one of the dull ones, and Gerald and I went in the other direction for a long feather, and by the time that we were ready for operations, it was within a quarter of an hour of lessons, and being rather sensible children, in some ways, we had early learnt experience and responsibility in our own affairs, having no one to advise or arrange for us in such matters. We decided it was better to wait till we were sure of plenty of and uninterrupted time. You see, if Fanny came shouting for us just as we had got into the tool house, she might see it, and it would be no longer a private place of our own. We must keep it quiet for our own, I said. Certainly, said Tib. "'You know I asked Grandpapa about it, and he didn't seem to mind. "'But lessons that morning did go very slowly. "'Once or twice Mr. Markham had to call us to attention, "'and there was even a slight threat on his part "'of extra work to be done for tomorrow "'if the rest of our preparation should not prove better done. "'It was not the fault of the preparation "'which had been done as well as usual. "'It was that our heads were all agog over the tool-house.' but we pulled up after this, and things ended fairly well. And at last, though not till after our dinner, for we were never allowed more than a run, and that well within view of the schoolroom window, between lessons and dinner, we found ourselves again in safety, before the door in the wall, oil cup and feather in hand. We set to work methodically, with the help of nurse's largest scissors and a skewer. How Gerald had got the skewer I don't know, we raked out all the little bits of dirt and rubbish that had collected in the lock. Then we oiled it as thoroughly as we knew how, though under the circumstances this was certainly a process of working in the dark. Then we carefully inserted the key. It went into perfection, but we all looked at each other and grew hot with excitement when it came to the moment for trying to turn it. Tib, as the eldest, had the first try. A barren honour. She hurt her hands over it, but it would not move not a hair's breadth. Then it came to me. I have larger hands than Tib, and stronger muscles. I fancy I set to work in a more business-like manner. With me the key turned, with groans and grunts, it must be allowed, but still it turned, half-way. Then I too looked blank. Fortunately it did not refuse to turn back again, and then I took it out and looked at it reproachfully. Gerald laid hands on it, it was his turn but what i had failed in it was not likely his little fat stumpy paws would achieve but gerald is sharp in some ways he first examined the key all over then he took up the oily feather again see here he said some parts of the key are quite oily but some inside are quite dry we should have oiled the key as well as the lock he was right his small grasp did what ours had failed in grunting and groaning still but forced to obey the old key woke from its sleep of thirty or forty years and did the work it was made for and in another minute we had tugged at the door till it moved on its rusty hinges you will understand afterwards how they came to be no rustier slowly opening and revealed what did it reveal for a few moments we were too dazzled to tell really dazzled as well as amazed a perfect flood of light seemed to pour out upon us and instead of the dingy musty tool house we had been expecting we found ourselves standing at what at first sight appeared like the entrance to some fairy palace of brightness and brilliance 
we stood dazed rubbing our eyes and looking at each other was it magic had we chanced upon some such wonder of old world times as our little heads were stuffed with tib and gerald too perhaps would have been ready to believe it had the door there and then shut upon us leaving us but the remembrance of the vision they would have lived upon beautiful fancies for the rest of their lives but i practical i did not long stand bewildered a slight creak of the door brought me back to commonplace come inside quick i said pulling at the others we were all huddled together on the steps shut the door or else some one will see the light through the trees for i have told you how very dark the tangle is even on a bright day stay dare we shut the door is there a keyhole on the inside oh yes and not rusty at all and quick as thought i drew the key out and fitted it in to the other side it turned now with ease that's right and before tib or gerald had found out for certain whether they were awake or dreaming we were all three safe inside the enchanted palace at liberty to look about us and find out where we really were i feel in a way sorry to explain it but this is not a fairy story and in the end i think you will allow when you have come to know the whole that it is very interesting perhaps more interesting than a fairy story after all so i will go on without leaving you in perplexity any more the place where we found ourselves was a conservatory it was prettily built in a high round roofed sort of way so as to catch all the light and sun heat possible it was to begin with a very bright afternoon then the shrubbery on our side was very dark high up in the conservatory there was a band of coloured glass rich red and little bits of every colour at the edge like a strip of rainbow through which the light came in gleams of all sorts of beautiful tints you can easily see how startlingly brilliant it had seemed to us and besides this the conservatory itself was not at all in a neglected state there were few pots of flowers the shelves were mostly empty but there were plants growing in earth borders along the sides which were evidently cared for as they twined up the walls luxuriantly and the whole place was heated though not very much that you see was how the door and the lock remained in such good condition we found out all these particulars for ourselves by degrees and gradually we noticed other things the conservatory had evidently at some time or other been a favourite place to sit in there was a little very old and shaky rustic table and two or three seats to match there was a little corner shelf on which still lay two or three old books after we had got over our first surprise we were conscious of something about the whole place which made the tears come to our eyes but our spirits soon rose again what a bower for the princess exclaimed tib i felt quite out of patience with her rubbish i said i can't think any more of the princess or any make-up things this is far more interesting i want to find out all about what place it is and why it is shut up and deserted as it evidently is perhaps it's been shut up for hundreds of years suggested gerald that's rubbish if you like answered tib it doesn't look as if anybody lived here but it's not dirty scarcely even dusty there must be some other way of getting into it besides our door then i said for certainly the door hasn't been opened for a great many years if we look about perhaps we'll find some other entrance at first sight there was no appearance of any and we began to think the conservatory must after all belong to rosebuds and that from time to time the gardener did open the door and get in to clean it only why then was it always locked up just as we were feeling quite puzzled gerald called out oh see here tib and gussie this is another door here in the glass here's a handle that turns why see it's a door made of looking-glass that was why we had not noticed it it was cleverly managed to imitate panes like the rest of the conservatory and it was somewhat in the shade in one corner there was no lock to this door it opened at once and before us we saw a long rather narrow covered passage lighted by a skylight roof it was all growing more and more mysterious half frightened but too eager and curious to think of being afraid on we ran 
the passage ended in a short flight of steps at the top of which was another door a regular proper door this time with a handle and a lock but no key in the lock oh supposing it's locked i cried excitedly it will be too bad we can't find out any more but it wasn't the key as we afterwards found was inside not turned in the lock they were evidently not very afraid of robbers all the years the house had stood empty no one had ever broken into it we were the first intruders we pressed forward first we found ourselves in a sort of little ante-room very small hardly bigger than a closet and out of this through another door opened a very large and handsome drawing-room it had a row of windows at one side looking out upon a terrace and a large bow window at one end with closely drawn blinds we could not see what it looked on to the floor was of beautifully polished wood inlaid in a pattern such as you see more often in french houses than in english ones the two mantelpieces were very high and beautifully carved and from the centre of the ceiling hung an immense gilt and crystal chandelier covered up in muslin there was not much furniture in the room and what there was looked stiff and cold two or three great cabinets against the walls and some gilt console tables and in one corner a group of sofas and chairs and armchairs all drawn together and all in white linen covers everything was handsome and stately and melancholy the very feeling of the room told you it had not been really lived in for many a day but the one thing which caught our attention was a life-size portrait hanging at the end of the room opposite the bow window it was the only picture of any kind and even though we were ignorant children we could see in a moment that it was a very beautiful one it represented a young girl richly dressed in the fashion of a hundred years ago or more with a long waisted bodice and skirt of white satin looped up over an under one of rose-coloured brocade she was standing on a terrace this very terrace we afterwards found her hat hanging on her arm and a greyhound beside her it was all pretty much the same as one often sees in portraits of that time but her face was so charming and immediately we saw it both gerald and i exclaimed oh tib she is exactly like you and going close to examine it more particularly i saw some letters in one corner and to my immense surprise there were those of the name scored out in the old book ornaments discovered and of tib's second name also regina the initials of the artist l k i think were there also it is my name said tib opening her eyes in astonishment how very strange can it be the picture of some great great grandmother of ours i wonder but this is not grandpapa's house how could any portrait of our family be here we were completely puzzled but children-like we did not think very much more about it it was such fun to slide up and down the polished floor or to climb over among the shrouded chairs and sofas and make ourselves a comfortable nest among them for it was plain that our discoveries were not to go further the large double doors of this drawing-room were securely locked from the outside we went close up to this door putting our ears to the keyhole even and listened but not the least sound was to be heard the house must be shut up i said there is certainly no one moving about in it perhaps it is enchanted said gerald in an awe-struck tone perhaps that lady is really alive and the fairies have fastened her up into that picture till till and he hesitated his imagination had come to an end of its flight tib and i looked at each other without speaking we did not snub gerald as we often did for such speeches somehow it didn't seem so very impossible everything was so strange the room itself so unlike anything we had ever seen the mysterious way into it the silence and desertedness yet the signs of care above all the portrait so wonderfully like tib and actually bearing her name there was no explaining it by anything we could think of or imagine we may as well use it all to make a play of said tib at last returning to her favourite idea we can pretend that the lady in the portrait is the princess something as gerald says yes it would be still nicer to make her be enchanted instead of only shut up and then gussie you must help me to plan how she's to be got out 
but tib i said do you think we can come here again don't you think grandpapa would mind after all he said to us about not making friends or going into any houses in the village and are we making friends said tib unless the portrait comes out of its frame some day and begins talking to us there's certainly nobody else to talk to here do you think there's nobody living in the house i said doubtfully i'm sure there's not most likely someone comes to dust it every now and then and don't you remember said gerald that last sunday i asked grandpapa if we might come through the door in the wall if we could and he said yes perhaps he knew about this place and didn't mind if we did come here to play perhaps i said anyway we can ask him the next time he comes we needn't say anything about it to mrs munt or nurse said tib decidedly as long as we haven't been told not to come we're not disobeying and it's much nicer not to ask any one but grandpapa himself with that i quite agreed especially as i felt sure grandpapa himself would like it better we knew we were doing no mischief there was nobody to speak to as tib had said so we felt quite at ease and spent a most agreeable afternoon when we had examined everything there was in the big drawing-room or saloon as tib preferred to call it and that did not take us very long there were no curiosities or small ornaments about as in the rosebuds drawing-room we began to plan again about our play story we arranged it most beautifully and the portrait was a great help for it almost gave us another actor as we could always pretend it was the princess when tib was wanted for another person and it was such a wonderfully lifelike picture you could really have fancied its expression changed as we talked to it but at last we began to get frightened that we should be missed at home if we stayed any longer we must go gussie said tib let us all say good-night to the princess it is sad to leave you alone here princess she went on turning to the portrait and speaking in the tone of one of the ladies in the play who were going to help her to escape but alas there is no other way to do if we stayed longer we should only be suspected of plotting so we must resign ourselves and i dare say you're pretty well accustomed to being left alone by this time you must be nearly a hundred years old though you look so young said gerald as he bowed to her i could not help laughing though tib was rather vexed i wish you wouldn't think it clever to turn everything into ridicule gerald but he looked up with such a surprised face that we saw he hadn't been in fun at all there's one thing we'd better do if we want ever to get in here again i said we must hide the key of the door leading from the passage i dare say the person who comes to dust will never notice it's not there they can't be in the habit of locking it regularly but it's as well to hide it and so saying i took the key out of the lock and slipped it inside a drawer of one of the big cabinets where it may be lying still for all i know i must look by the by writing this all out has reminded me of several things i'd forgotten then we closed the door carefully and ran down the passage to the conservatory again where we found everything just as we had left it our key as we called it sticking in the lock inside it was still rather stiff to turn and the next morning we oiled it again but we managed to unlock it and then to lock the door again on the outside and gerald ran off with the key to hide it again in the summer-house only we wrapped it up in paper before burying it in the fir dust who would have thought said tib as we ran in who could have thought what we should find this afternoon but our surprises as you shall hear were not yet at an end, end of chapter six